All right, today we're gonna to walk a 23 unit apartment building in a very hot part of Denver called the Lower Highlands. So there's lots of new build class A's all around here. So it's a 23 unit apartment building with a duplex lot, another lot next to it that Terrence got over two years ago, and he's just wrapping up the project. Let's go check out the details. What's up, guys? Chris, what's up, dude? Terrence, I was just telling one outside about the 23 apartment building. It's been going on for two years. That's right. I know we got a lot of stuff to talk about, but first, our guest is Lauren Valinotti. Hey. She's an agent here in Denver. We do a lot of work together on my team. She knows investments. I want to bring along so you could ask some questions and learn about multifamily. So Lauren, glad to have you here. Thanks so much for having me, you yeah, guys. Thanks for coming. Beautiful project. So Terrence, I told them you got this about two years ago. It took a little bit longer than we anticipated, but just start walking us through what we're doing this unit here and tell us what's going on. Yeah, it's been a labor of love, as I like to call it. This was probably the most excited I've ever been about a project. I worked on it for eight months to put it under contract. Uh, the seller actually built it with his dad in the 60s owned it free and clear, fell on some financial hard times in the early 2000s. I actually took out a hard money loan against the property and the punchline was he was in foreclosure and I worked eight months to tie it up and close it. And then we closed on it, had a bunch of issues with the city, which we can talk about later. And now we're almost at the very end and we should start leasing the next week. And so this is one of your finished units, right? That's right. This is the finished unit is what we're using to, we're gonna stage this unit this weekend and we'll use this as the model unit to sign the leases for the rest of the building. All right, well, give us a tour. Yeah, let's check out the bathroom. Okay, so Lauren, here we are in a renovated bathroom. We'll show the befores okay. on, the sh on the show, but basically this was all carpet when oh, we yummy. purchased it. Carpet and some of them had some linoleum and the toilet was actually closer to where you're standing. Okay. And there was basically just like a a sink that came out of the wall. Okay. Old and sink. an old sink. That's right. Yeah. And well, then, I'm definitely noticing here that there's not a glass shower shower door here. So can you kind of touch a little bit on that? That's an interesting observation. So what we found when we were doing this, because we couldn't really move any walls, was that we would save roughly a thousand dollars per unit by oh, not wow. having to do shower doors because these would be custom. Yeah. So what we did was we did a water fout shower head where basically the water just comes straight down and it kind of added to the industrial feel that we're trying to get. Yep. since it's a higher end, kind of trendier neighborhood. So, so we were able to accomplish two things. We were able to accomplish the aesthetic we wanted and also save some money for having to order custom custom shower yeah. doors. And when you have 23 units, $1,000 per, per unit is a good size. Yeah, so we're able to show that to our investors. These are the little ways we're able to save money. Um, Smart. Yeah, and then you see we just do our traditional 12 by 24 tile mm -hmm. to kind of make it look the same thing, just an industrial look. We do these standard, you know, these vanity, the little higher end vanity for this neighborhood that we would normally do. And then we just painted it gray and did uh, subway tile in the showers to kind of give it that same industrial look. And uh, we were, and we succeeded on completing the uh, you know the renovation that we were looking for, the feel and the look that we yeah. needed for this neighborhood. The finishes you guys picked is really high end finish. This is what you're seeing in all these brand new apartments around town. Just the little things like this, the hardware on the door makes such a big difference. It really gives that, that higher dollar amount for your rents that you're trying to accomplish. Yeah, I'm glad you noticed that because we used to do brushed nickel. Okay. And in oh, this nice. neighborhood, we want to do black. Yeah. Yeah, and so black matches. So we try and have all the fixtures match each other. Yeah. And so we went black and went with a two panel door. The two panel door is maybe $50 more, but again, gives it that higher end industrial aesthetic, yep. which is what we were going for in this neighborhood. And especially whenever you're competing, there's a brand new build right down the, right. the street. So yeah, you're competing with that, that same deal, so. Little things like that. That's exactly that. right. When we're costing. comping rents, we're looking at what are the class A buildings around here? What are they charging? And what are the amenities they're offering? And what are the finishes? And how do we offer a similar finish, but for five or $600 less a month? Well, I can definitely see myself living here. This is a, a great, great finished product in the bathroom. That's a huge compliment. The fact that we could have younger, successful women in the, you know, that's kind of our target market for as a tenant. And so that's, uh, that actually makes my good. heart, heart good. feel good. <laughs> Let's check out the bedroom here. Okay. What's up, Chris? Well, the bathroom's a little tight. Yeah, so it was I tight. Join you we guys in here. Two of us in there. So I'm curious, I'm always interested in these buildings. What's the heater set up in here? That's a boiler system. When we purchased the building, it had a bunch of pinholes and it was leaking. Every Almost every single unit was leaking. So we had to replace the entire boiler system, run all new water lines to every single unit. So, and then all new registers. So the registers, roaches, bed, I mean, this place had been just over the years 
had just been really run down. There was, when we walked in here initially, there was families with four, five, six people living in here. Oh, wow. I mean, it was really sad. And these are 18 one bedrooms and five studios. So you can imagine walking in here, seeing multiple children and grandparents. I mean, it was really sad. So this had been completely misused not taking care of anything. So we had to come in here and that was one of the most, I mean, even though that looks really simple to actually pull that off was a ton of work. So is that a cheaper fix to just repair this service versus putting in the forced air for the heat? Yeah, forced air in this kind of building would have required us, you know, to run ducting. Right. It would have required so much more from the architect and the engineer in the city. So since it already had a boiler, we could just replace like for like and didn't have to really have mechanical plans. And does that do affect the rent rent rates of having a boiler system versus a forced air? So I prefer, I'm glad you brought that up. I prefer forced air and forced heat, but in a building like this in apartments, almost everybody has boiler heat. Okay. I mean, especially anything built in the 60s. So what we're off, what we're competing with is not necessarily low high that has forced mm -hmm. heat and forced air. We're competing with the other class B buildings down the road that also have boilers, but they just don't have all the amenities and the upgraded finishes that we're going to have. Okay. So. Yeah, would we have liked to do that? Yeah, in a perfect right. world, in a new build, we would have done that. But when we're looking at just a renovation and you start getting the city involved in a building this old in this neighborhood, we just had to do a like for like boiler swap out. And, you know, basically we had to go through all the subfloors to run the water lines and then have it come up, you know, basically just brand new register so it looks clean and brand new. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so that's that was one of the big dollar items. You know, so one of the things that we did in this building versus other ones that we've walked, Chris, is we did an upgraded LVT. So we still have uh, the luxury vinyl uh, plank flooring, but it's just a thicker, it was basically double the thickness. And so that, you know, and then did two things. It comes with a pad underneath that basically helps with the sound barrier. For, the, for the people below. For the people yeah. below, you know, again, in this, we're thinking about the tenant, who's gonna live here? How are we gonna get the rents that we're asking? And so we upgraded the flooring and then we did an accent wall in every single bedroom. And so basically what we did was ship laps really in right now. So everyone that's watching HGTV or anything, you know, um, any, any of those shows that we, that everyone loves. We basically, you know, ship laps really, really popular. So we did our own version of ship lap. This is actually plywood that we cut into strips and then put on there to look like ship lap and painted it. And by doing that, we basically saved a hundred dollars a unit. So nice. you know, another $2,300 on top of, so that's kind of how, what I've built my reputation out of my career, just always finding ways to get creative and how we save money. And at the end of the year, when you do, 100 or 200 units where you've saved 100, you know, and it that's kind of what makes up. it all adds up. Absolutely. So yeah, we did the accent wall. Uh, we did the two tone. So we did the Dorian gray paint for the ceiling and the wall, and then the white baseboard trim. The white baseboard trim, we actually did a little bit thicker, again, just to add to that feel and that aesthetic of an industrial higher end, higher end building. You mean for like they were taller or, th or thicker wide? Because this taller. looks taller Tall. than we normally Tall. do, right? Yeah, taller, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So in older buildings, you'll have a two or three inches as a five inch. Yeah. And it just adds to that the same thing, just the look and the feel of making it higher end. So well, let's go check out the kitchen. We did some cool things in there, and I think you guys will. Uh, I think I'm interested to get your opinion. Great. Even though it looks really small and simple, it actually took a lot of planning and design to have it come out looking like this. I bet. So don't let it fool you. Um, so just first off the bat here, I'm just noticing you got this beautiful stovetop here, but I'm looking around and I'm not seeing a oven. Can you kind of touch a little bit on that? Yeah. So as I mentioned earlier. This building came with a lot of complications. Okay. And one of them is, one of the learning lessons from an investor standpoint was, when you're buying something in a very dense area that has a lot of attention, you have to be very careful about not upgrading any of the appliances okay. or the electrical output. So even though this building was built to code in the 60s, what was to code in the 60s is not to code now. So even though these had electric ranges when it was operating when we bought it, okay. once we started renovating and and uh, updating the building. This was one of the things that had to go. So even the, so, we bought it and had electric ranges. Once we went through the city process and we were doing our changes of the plumbing, of the boiler, and of the kitchen, okay. one of the things we learned was that it was no longer to code to have electric ranges for the amount of power that was coming into the building. And so what we had to do was we had to downgrade you know, the dishwasher that we had, the fridge, basically anything that was gonna pull on electricity, we had to downgrade for it to meet the calculations which is a whole nother story. But the punchline was we had to go with a stovetop, which I haven't seen before either. So we had to go with a higher end stovetop and then we're gonna have shelving underneath. What we think will happen is most of the tenants will bring their own microwave in. Okay. So they'll bring their own microwave, the stovetop will act as the you know, cooktop, It'll mm -hmm. you know, they'll get the same function out of it. And then hopefully the microwave is as, uh, as the oven or a substitute. It's not ideal, but again, in this neighborhood, I'm not really sure how much cooking people are doing because they can walk down the street 
and go to a bar, or restaurant, or order in, DoorDash, order in. Yeah. all the all the different. We don't know. I'm I'm not sure how many of the tenants here are actually cooking every night. So I don't know how much the stove or the oven actually they Back need it over exactly. Okay. Yep. Well, you said yeah. people come here for the location, the bars, the restaurants. That's right. So I guess you have the option: you can either downgrade the appliances or probably upgrade the entire electrical system in the building, right? That was the that was the coin we had to flip, and obviously the electrical ends up being multiple hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. You're talking about opening up every single wall, and that was something that we just did not have the time or the bandwidth to do and really the need to. You know, we think that rents may be a little bit lower, but they're still gonna be well above what we had pro forma uh, We can go into the rents later, but basically when we bought the building, the average rent was 850, and we think uh, when we lease it up this month, it'll be around 1350. So we hit our numbers, we almost, you know, almost two X on the rents from previous, and you know, could we get a little bit more if we had uh, traditional range with the oven and the cooktop? Yeah, probably, but it just wasn't in the card. So that's one of the things that I learned that you know, we'll do better in the future. Because this was one of your first uh, apartment buildings that you started taking down, right? One of the largest ones in Denver, yeah. yeah. Those, those are the first 20 plus unit that I'd purchased in Denver, that's yeah. right. Yeah. So the electrical is one of the things that delayed you? One of the things, okay. yeah. There was a few more, but yeah, one of the biggest things, yes. Good, the learning yeah. curves, the learning, learning experiences are good for this. Yeah. yeah. One yes. of the good things about multifamily, which is why I'm really, uh, you know, excited that you're here, Lauren, is that, you know, even when you mess up in a project like this, because of the compounding effect of buying income producing assets, that produce cash flow, it's really hard to lose. So even though we lost 12 months of you know over budget, we're still going to do pretty well on the on it, and we've learned a bunch of lessons. And so whenever you're able to learn those kind of lessons and still make money, I think it's a complete win. You know, versus single family, if you make a mess up like this, not only going to sell the home for less, but you probably went way up enough budget to where you wiped out all your profit. And you're probably you're writing a check at closing. And here we're still you know because of where we bought it and because of the power of every you know month monthly cash flow will be will still be really good. Well, this is excellent. You're able to share these types of lessons that you're learning, you know, with everybody who's able to watch the show and hopefully you guys will be able to pick up on that little tip and uh, learn from the lesson moving forward. Yeah, hopefully you don't make the same mistake I made. Hopefully watching this helps save you a lot of time and money and heartache. Absolutely. So yeah. So give us a rundown because um, we've done, you know, I've walked tons of your properties. Uh, we've done a bunch of shows on here before. This kitchen is nicer than the average That's rental right. product you put out. What are the upgrades and like, what was the total cost on this? Like just for the kitchen? Yeah, typically we spend about 12 to 15,000 a unit and we're about 30,000 in this one with all the permitting, the architect, with all the planning, all the customization of the different appliances that we needed. So even, you know, like we've done a lot of black leather in the past, but we've never done black leather with butcher block. So we actually had to cut the black leather, customize the butcher block to fit the stovetop. We haven't done a lot of venting, uh, these kind of higher end uh, brush nickel vents. Um, as you can see, we, did, we still did the shelves, Chris, which I love, and I've talked a lot about uh, how much you save by doing some upper shelves versus all cabinets. Again, knowing your demographic in this neighborhood with this size of a unit, we're not gonna have families that need a bunch of storage. So we can still have some storage, and then it looks aesthetically pleasing and helps set us apart from some of the other buildings in the neighborhood. So that was basically it. We did you know, our, just our traditional little upgraded cabinet um, the, from the traditional ones that we use at Home Depot. Uh, these are a little bit more, a little bit longer lasting, more durable. Um, I talked about the appliances, how they'd be custom for the el electrical output and the size that we had. Um, I other like than the backsplash. It's nice that you have, you know, a focus point not only in the kitchen, but you also kind of get that wow factor in the master uh, room also. Yeah, this yeah, is one of the, I'm glad you noticed that. Yeah, and that's what we're trying to cater to is really trying to market to the female audience. You know, they're mostly the ones that are going to be, we think, living in here or them and their boyfriend or their, and their mm -hmm. hu you know, husband that are they're newly married or in a- Right, you know. but it's a small cost. It's still yeah. the subway tile, which is a, you know, it's not a, a huge cost on it, but just by changing up the pattern, right. you're able to add a nice wow factor. We make it so pop a little bit, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, and we did that in the showers as well. And then with the accent walls, we tried to just customize it. As you'll see, the backsplash in the different units is all different. So oh, every okay. single one kind of had its own pattern, oh, just to kind of change it up. Uh, so that along with the mural on the exterior are just ways that, you know, small, small investment where we think we get a big impact out of it. So I'm glad that you noticed that. that I've got a question, because I know you, you do multiple projects at one time, correct? That's right. So do you, are you able to split your, your crew between all of your, all of your different projects? Or do you kind of just have them focus on one at a time and just bring them in as their portion of their work is, is ready? Yeah, construction is one of the most important parts of this whole business plan. And so it's really important to nail that down. So we, Primarily use the same electrician, same plumber, and same mechanical HVAC guy. 
So that's always the same. But then we'll use different guys for texture, paint, flooring, um, okay. granite. You know, based on availability and based on how many projects and where the location is, we can use different guys to do some of the cosmetic work, like the shelves. Anybody can basically come and install shelves. But those really important trades, uh, the mechanicals, I call it, you know, like boiler, the heat, the AC, the plumbing, the electrical, any of those things, even the roofer. You know, I like to have the companies that I've used that are bonded, that I have a track record with, that I know are not fly-by-night guys, and that I can, if there's an issue, they'll come back and fix it once the building's full. So, does that answer your question? Absolutely. Yep. Okay. And also, too, one more question. Do you ever like to, you know, like on the subway tile, for example, would you ever want to buy that in bulk? Just, like, would that be enough of a cost, you know, savings for you just to just buy, like, a pallet full yeah. of subway tile? Right. Or is that cost savings so small it's not even worth bringing in on? Yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's an excellent point. So we've gone back and forth on it. Um, in Des Moines, we've done several hundred unit projects. And on those, it definitely makes sense to order the tile and all those, and even paint in bulk. And if you can time it right with like Menards, Home Depot, and Lowe's, you can get some, maybe an additional 15 to 20% savings, which on orders that large really makes a lot of sense. On projects that are smaller, what I've found is that it's almost better to do it, you know, the flooring we will definitely do, mm -hmm. and the fixtures, you know, some of the uh, cabinet poles and those kind of things. But like even the plumbing fixtures, I can't tell you how many plumbing fixtures we lost because we ordered them at once just because okay. guys end up not caring as much. But what we've done is we'll have the plumber order his fixtures and he's responsible for them. So if he loses them, he has to replace them. If the electrician, he orders the lights, he's responsible for them. Versus I can save a little bit, you know, maybe five to 10% in cost, but then I lose that by the fact that no one's really owning it, you know, because yeah. they're, you know, if they lose it, it's not on them, it's my money that lost it. So what I've, found, I've kind of gone back and forth on it and I've kind of like landed somewhere in the middle mm -hmm. of, on larger projects, we definitely, and we have storage there. We can store the stuff, order everything in bulk. When it's under 20, under 25 units, some of the things we can do in bulk, such as the flooring and the paint, mm -hmm. and I think everything else, it's better to have the contractor be responsible for and own, so that if they lose it, it's on them, not on you. That makes sense. But that's something, it's one of the things we've learned along the way, and we've definitely tried both, mm -hmm. and I think we landed somewhere in the middle, so. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's check out the rest of the building. So guys, one of the interesting things about this building that we haven't ever done in another building is we added Murphy beds in the studios. And again, the thinking behind that was thinking about the tenant and the neighborhood. So because the most likely tenant in this neighborhood is gonna be a young professional, they may be traveling, they may only be here for a year or six months, they may not wanna go out and buy a bed. So we, we're gonna experiment with these Murphy beds. Uh, we got these for $1,300 and basically, with uh, the mattress for thirteen hundred, the mattress with the mattress is thirteen. Yeah, okay. I believe the Murphy bed was a little under a thousand. So what's nice is, and they have stands there. Mm -hmm. But what's nice is we think we can get an extra one hundred to one hundred and fifty a month with the Murphy bed. That's what the comp show. So basically, we'll make the investment back in a year, and we have an added feature. You know, so we'll see how it goes. But this is one of the things I'm really excited to test, and it, and it was the right neighborhood and the right unit mix. Uh, to see how it see how it goes, and so you're able to find rental comps for Murphy beds because I have yet to see any rental comps with, with Murphy beds. She she comped it with staged, okay. partially staged uh, apartments in the area. So she comped it with that. So that was so she probably took half of it. Maybe they're three or four hundred dollars more a month in this neighborhood. Like I know next door the property we own, we were able to get I think an extra three hundred a month with staged furniture, partially staged. So I think they had beds and like a couch. You mean staged for them to use or just for them to use? Okay. For them to use, like they got to keep the furniture. Okay. Yeah. So I think that's what the comp was off. Okay. But I yeah, Murphy bed. Like... It's very hard to find a Murphy bed yeah. comp exactly. But I think she was. I'm guessing she went off of. Staged. Because none of the new buildings out here have like Murphy no. beds, are okay. Although I think some of them, you know, like there's one down the street, I think some of them might have partial, like where you can get the bed and the sofa, but not like the whole thing, you know. I don't this think is a really thing. cool idea. Yeah, yeah. It, was good. It, was, it fit. Creative, yeah. for sure. Yeah, so we'll see how it goes, but I was excited just because it's one of those ideas that you read about, you see, and it's like, oh, I, I wonder how that would do in our market. So we'll get the chance to see it. But yeah, I mean, I think whenever you can spend, whenever you can recoup your investment on any kind of amenity like that in your first year, normally you're two or three years. So for something small like this, and you know, even if we only get $50 a month, we recoup it back in two years, we're still, you know, still be fine. And I mean, the upkeep on this is nothing. It's just a mattress right? when yeah. someone moves out, yeah. So one of the things I wanted to point out, since we've talked a lot about construction, yeah. I know your background in helping single family fix and flippers, is one of the things I learned when you start doing larger projects is you have to write down the punch list and every phase. Because what happens is guys end up taking longer lunches, they think they're really ahead when they're not, and just a, 
and things can fall really behind. On single family, they can fall behind. Oh, absolutely. But on a project this scope, yeah. they can fall really behind. So what I do is you gotta know your subs, right? Yep. And so most of our subs, since I speak Spanish, they speak Spanish. Oh, to say, yeah, this is not in English. That's it's not obviously in English. In It'll Spanish, be harder, so you're yeah. making it easy for everybody. So through the years, I've been able to develop like a army of Hispanic subs since I spoke Spanish and those were the guys that I attracted. And so what I started doing on larger projects was just writing for the month what the punch list is. And naturally, if they get it done, they get a little bonus at the end of the month That's that they perfect. get it done in time. And if not, so here I have the date that it needs to be done by and the list of things. So that way they can always go by, check it off and be looking because most sometimes like the lead sub or GC isn't always on site. Right. So then the other guys that are in the crew need to be able to go and instead of having an excuse, oh, Juan wasn't here, blah, blah, blah. Communication is key and right. time is everything for you. So this is smart just to have this tool here. That's right. Everybody knows exactly what, what they're doing. There's not any questions asked. And then also by giving them that little bonus, X amount of days, you get it done, you know, you're going to be able to take your family out, you know, on a nice, nice dinner. That's right. For your hard 100%. Work, so yeah. That's great. You're always trying to find ways to align interest, you know, with brokers, with contractors, with bankers, you know, every single way that we can along the process align interest. Yeah, because when we're, you know, on single family, you know, we would be spending maybe two to three thousand a month of holding cost. On multifamily, you're spending ten to twenty thousand a month, depending on the size of the project. So, like sometimes five hundred dollars a day. So then that starts to motivate you to really fine tune. How do I get guys to do things faster, still get the quality? And so this is what we've learned. So hopefully that helps a lot of you guys at home, regardless of the size of project. Punch list. Write, write the punch list down every Bonus. month, and so they can see it. And there's no excuses. It's a great idea. Let's check out some other units here, and I can show you some of the things that we were in the middle of doing. Yeah, you got some more work to do in this unit. Yeah, as you can see, this is still an active site. So one of the things we did, even though the other units are maybe a month behind, we did one 100% finish and we'll stage it to put on online and have brochures and we can still have showings. Certainly. So what we'll do is we'll bring in prospective tenants on the weekends and bring them up to that one unit. They can still see the exterior, they can see the parking lot, and it helps us lease before the whole building's finished. Like I said, the holding costs are really high. So that kind of helps supplement, offset some of those holding costs, having one unit finished before everyone else, before the other ones. So this one is an example of the different back, backsplash uh, design, same sort of tile, but just did it in a different pattern. Sorry. That's right. We told the tile guy we wanted five or six different patterns and to kind of, you know, just go through the line just to make every room kind of feel custom. And yeah, this is one example of that. We did the same thing with the with the plywood that was painted as an accent wall. Every kind of room and floor has a different design. Again, just to make it kind of feel custom and something more hippie. Hipster, mm -hmm. not hippie. Hipster, sorry. <laughs> oh, I have this tile in my house too. I love this. Are you sure you don't just want to move in? I feel like you're liking a lot of these features. <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. you, could, uh, you could help with leasing. We could find a way for you to make some money, have free rent. Sounds good. Anyways, so yeah, we did a kind of an artsy tile to go along with the rest of the theme. Other than that, it's just a standard laundry room. We'll have brand new appliances. We'll probably go based on the neighborhood, not coin operated, probably like the new car technology or something else. Maybe we'll take Bitcoin, I don't know. Something so people don't have to bring coins <laughs> and you can still get the money. I highly recommend having as many, you know, in a building this size in this neighborhood. You know, it's a lot of income. I think we normally get from five to 10 units between $100 and $200 a month. So this size, we should be getting somewhere between four and $500 a month in extra oh, nice. income. Okay. So it's definitely something at the end of the year, six yeah. to $8,000. So you definitely want to do it. People hate going to a laundromat. It's the so worst. we just want to have a nice safe. We'll probably do something artsy on one of the walls just to make it feel like home, feel Good cozy. Idea. And how many washer dryers? It looks like there's two hookups. There's two hookups, and I think we'll add a third okay. on this one. But yeah, I'd like to have, I think, yeah, the two right now, but I think we're supposed to add a third. But something on the income behind. too, you know, not the extra $6,000 a year, but when you go to sell it, I mean, that that's has, right. what, I mean, for this investment, that's a huge multiplier effect on the on the purchase price, or the sales price. Yeah, every every $100 we say is like 20,000 on the back end at a six cap, so that's a lot of math, but yeah, probably several hundred thousand dollars on 6,000, six to 8,000 a year, so yeah. And we'll dive in that yeah. at the end of the show. All right, well, let's uh, head out. Let's go out. All right, so one of the final things about the building that I think makes it unique is that we zero scape the entire property. In Denver, if anyone knows Denver, as you guys do since you've lived here, it's very dry. Yep. So, in, And when we looked at our properties at the end of the year, we ended up spending thousands of dollars on irrigation because it's so dry. So what I've started to do is either just zero scape it with mulch or gravel. And in this location, I chose to do a little bit upgraded finish, which was the AstroTurf. And even though it looks like really clean and, and really good, it's actually really expensive and harder to apply than I realized. But we've done this on two projects now 
and it's turned out amazing. And I think over, you know, since this will be a longer hold for us, I think over the course of five, 10 years, we'll save thousands and thousands of dollars. And hopefully it'll keep the same color and it'll, you know, what, I, what bothers me about sometimes rock and mulch is that you get these like little whiskers of weeds and grass oh, that grow yeah. up. And then an area it's like this, it's just like, clean. it doesn't look as attractive, right? So with this, we should have no issues. And we still did a little bit of gravel to kind of offset it. But I was really pleased with how this turned out. Yeah. I think it adds a lot to the mural and to the painting uh, and to some of the, some of the, you know, the entrance and the overall feel. What was the cost on, on the turf? This actually cost us $9,000. Okay. But we zero scaped the whole thing. And I think this will pay out. We would probably spend several hundred dollars a month just in the irrigation to keep it looking this color. And that, so if I hold it three or four years, it pay for itself and hopefully it'll keep this color and look, they say that it lasts for five to 10 years. So- it looks awesome. Yeah, it looks really looks good. Really so nice. I was really excited about it. It was the first time I've done it. And then we, it turned out so well, we did it on another project. So yeah, hopefully all of these things end up adding to just a lower expense, a lower expenses every month and increasing the uh, income, which is the whole goal. Great. Great. All right, Terrence, I've noticed you're starting to put a lot of murals on your buildings. Why is that? Are you see more rents? What's the deal? So in this particular building, things were taking so long to get approved by the city and architects that I got bored and I was tired of driving by seeing the ugly brick that needed tuck pointing and was falling apart. So I just decided to paint it and bring someone in to spice it up. And I really fell in love with it. I, you know, we wanted to do something positive for the city and the neighborhood, as well as make it pop when people drove by. And so it went so well on this one that I started doing on some other buildings in specific areas. I think near like parks or lakes yeah. where people can yeah. still walk, where there's a lot of walkability and kind of a younger tenant base. And yeah, so it's been great. We've had a bunch of people driving by asking us, you know, when it's going to be available, uh, a bunch of people taking pictures. So it's been really good to get the exposure, kind of get word of mouth and just make the building look a little bit more attractive from the street. What's it cost? I was about to ask yeah. the same thing. I have What's no the idea cost? about this. Well, if you're cheap like me, not very much. I think traditionally it can get pretty pricey just like anything else. But I had a guy that I had built a relationship with and I basically told him that he could do several buildings if it went well. And so we've kind of worked on a fixed cost. But I think you're probably talking between a building this size, somewhere between ten and $20,000, uh, uh, depending okay. on how much artwork and how, versus font, you know, and how many words versus pictures and, you know, how detailed you want. They're also going to do a mural in the hallways that kind of plays off of this theme. And so, yeah, so we, we were able to get this building done a little bit cheaper, but from the prices that I've seen, somewhere between ten dollars and $20,000. Cool. Yeah, All right. and I think well worth it on you know, the exposure and the marketing and kind of what it brings you. Right. Well, let's head to the studio and talk some numbers. All right, let's do it. All right, guys, we are back in the studio. Chris here, Terrence and Lauren are back in the studio. So we're gonna go through and do some financials on the apartment building that we just walked in Denver, Colorado. So uh, Terrence, that was a 22 unit, right? 23. 23 unit, okay. So what we're gonna do here, uh, we got the financials printed out. We will show those on the screen here in a second, but we're gonna go through the Bigger Pockets website and go through and use the Bigger Pockets calculator to uh, plug in some numbers. So we're gonna do the Burr calculator, because I know you're gonna, this is good to look at it this way because you can plug in the property data, see what it looks like when you take it down, refinance it, see what it looks like as a rental property, and also gives you the exit strategy as well. Awesome, let's do it. So we'll see how I can do it. Oh, I'm, I'm talking in front of you guys. So we're just gonna say 23 unit apartment building. Property address, we'll just say Denver. And do you know what the annual property taxes are? What do we Ooh. have on here? 15, looks like 15, 187. Okay, so what we are doing here, I've got, you guys will be seeing us a lot more. So we have got this spreadsheet or this uh, uh, document pulled up there. It shows the numbers. So real estate property taxes, 15,187, right? That's right. And so that's all the data we need on here. Obviously you can put in more photos and pictures, but for this, we're not doing that. Purchase price. So what did you buy it for? It's been a couple of years, so <laughs> I, need to look, I need to reference my sheet here. We bought it for $2.85 million. All right. Is that the right amount of zeros in there? Yep. I think so. All right. Now, quick thing on here is like, let's go about how you found this property. Because this is a really interesting thing. How did I find it? I was introduced. So this is a strategy not a lot of people talk about. It was under, con it was a listing agreement with a broker in town they were not able to sell it. The seller was really unrealistic. They brought multiple, multiple offers. 
were not able to sell it. The listing agreement expired. And then a buddy of mine called and said, hey, we couldn't sell this. Here's the guy's number. We think you might be able to do a better job just going directly to him because he, he had a thing against brokers apparently. And so I spent six months building a relationship with this gentleman who actually was the original builder. Him and his dad built the property. So he was in love with it, you know, had an affinity towards it, you know, was, was just a really unique individual. Um, and so I spent six months building a relationship with him and then we were able to finally close January of 2019. And I met him April or May. Actually, you were with me the first time I went to look at it, but April or May of 2018. Yeah. What was he originally asking for? He originally was asking 4.75 for the entire. So he had that, there was a duplex and then a lot. 4.75 was what he was asking. And so this 285, is that for the whole property or just for the apartment? That was the apartment. Okay. We closed at 3.7 for the lot, the duplex, and the apartment. And so we peeled off, you know, the different parcels. And so we ended up assigning this value at 2.85, which was, you know, we, I think the duplex we had at 500 and the lot at 300. And so actually, so in this show, we walked the 23 unit apartment building in another ride along show. We did the duplex next door. That's right. That was with Alex and Erica. I don't know what that show's called, but it, we had Alex and Erica as a guest on I think there. that one's coming up, right? It's about to re-release. Uh, yes, it, I think right. so. Yeah. I think it'll be after this video. I'm not sure. Cool. So, okay, 2.85 for this, for just for this portion of the building. What's your ARV estimate on here? If we were going to list the, at a five, that's a, at a five, I think in a quarter cap, which is what this area trades at, I think it's 5.2 million. So five, I mean, I, I think five and a quarter. Is pretty conservative. Yeah. It I could easily be in the fours. Yeah. I think it's very conservative. Yeah. So I got to make sure I got my numbers in here, right? There we go. So obviously that's a big spread right there. Now, when you purchase a property, do you uh, know what your closing costs were? 1%. 1%. Yeah. So we'll just say, what, 28500 That's right. Okay. And repair costs. Yeah, we ended up spending, I don't know what we had on the budget here, but now that we're close to the end, we spent real close to $850,000. Okay. And it you says 1.25 there, which I think that included some other fees but our actual cost were 850. Where do you see the 1.25 on Up here? at the top development property cost summary top right. Okay. But that included cuz this was for we were going to syndicate this and that was for acquisition fee, asset management fee, like you lump all that into development costs and then a development fee. Okay. So that's not relevant to this. Yep. Conversation. And so you said 850. 850. And so that's what you projected this was the actual and we projected, I think, uh, six fifty probably okay. back then. We were probably at six fifty. I, I remember this property. Six fifty or seven. Yeah, it's everything been difficult. did not go quite according to plan. Has right? not gone according to plan. <laughs> like, if I recall correctly. Which is the good thing about buying cash flowing properties. Yeah. You can make a ton of mistakes, which I did, and still come out. Because okay. when you bought it, it was it had a lot of tenants in there, right? It was full. Okay. When you bought it, it was full. I mean, it's under market, but at least tenants were in there and they're paying rent, right? The average rent was eight hundred eight hundred twenty five dollars. For this neighborhood, it's probably four to four hundred to five hundred under market. Yeah, so this is the Highlands. What do you? I mean, you do place over there. I mean, yeah, Lauren's crushing the Highlands right yeah. now. I mean, on like a two bed, one bath. I mean, definitely going to be like fifteen hundred. Yeah, for sure, minimum. So right, yeah. yeah. So they are way under. All right, what was your financing like for this? Do you remember? We did a construction loan. This was the first construction loan we've actually done in Denver. We did a construction loan with First Bank. And they did 75% of total cost. So we'll say you put, so including the down payment plus your construction. construction. Yeah, 75% okay. of total cost. So, so let's say the total cost were 3.8. They lent us 75% of that. Okay, so let's put in the actual value here. So if you... So the loan amount was, I know this, it was 2.6 million was the loan amount. 2.6 million. Okay, so 2.64. All right, we'll do that. Interest rate was five. That's not that bad for a construction on that size. Especially a year, you know, two years ago. Yeah. I mean, five was solid, yeah. Now yeah. you should be sub four. Now actually First Bank is willing to do a refi, I think, in the mid to high threes, like 3.75. But yeah, at this point in time, five was solid. Yeah. Did they charge it in points? One point. So one point? And any other, probably, I mean, no appraisal charges. Yeah, it was... 5,000 bucks maybe total. I mean, whatever. 
Uh, and did you pay those out, or did you wrap the loan fees into the loan? We had to pay that. Okay. Uh, interest only? We got interest only for 18 months. So we'll just say yes, and no, no PMI. PMI on a construction loan. That's right. And uh, you're planning on refinancing. We're going to refinance or sell. Well, wait, wait, let me ask you this. What was the original plan to refinance or sell? The original plan was to sell. Yeah, but sure. after how many months? Oh, you know, we would have been in and out in like 14, 15 months. Okay. You know, so, Jersey, we did 22 units in Denver. That was another property. And we were in and out in 16 months. And it was the same size. Actually, okay. smaller square footage. And you're, what do you think this refinance or sell will be? Because you're going to refinance and hold for a while, right? And then I so? think so, yeah. yeah. I think we're going to do a cost seg. Um, yeah, it'll be November, December this year. So, so it'd be... Was that like 26 months? Yeah, twenty or a little less than 24, right? Because January to... Jan, basically January to January, right? January of 2019 to January of 2021. Yeah, all right. So we'll like, say 24 months. Yeah. Uh, estimated rehab time? 20 I mean, months. 20 months, yeah. <laughs> um, Brutal. Yes. Wild. Makes a, I learned learned a, makes lot, a really though. good video, though. Yeah, it makes a good video, and I learned a lot, so it's uh, it was good. And yeah. this was like your first Denver apartment building, right? Or one of your it, first? It was the largest project I've done okay. in Denver to date, but it was probably the 20th I've done yeah. in Denver. Yeah. Um, so the new loan amount, do you know what you're going to refinance it for? Let's just say it's worth five and a quarter. We'll get 80% of that, 80% of appraised value. So would that be like four million bucks? So we'll say five and a quarter... Times 0. 0.8, so about 420. 420. And we should be, should be let's just call it 375. Do, what, do you know what the terms will be on that? I mean, are you doing are you doing agency debt? Yeah, we'll or? do agency for sure, okay. most likely. And then we'll see if one of the local banks wants to match it. But we'll definitely get a term sheet from, we've already been talking to a couple different uh, agency brokers. We could go, you can go two years I.O., and then seven years fixed, I think, is probably where we'll be. So let's let's unpack 25 that. 25-year AM. What is agency debt? Agency just means it's government-sponsored, and it's non-recourse, which means there's no personal guarantee, which means we have less risk. And they're normally, because it's subsidized by the government, it's much lower interest rate than typical other local and national banks. And they're willing to give you a higher LTV, so most local banks would probably go 75, even 70 right now in the middle of a pandemic, but they're willing to go 80 of appraised value. Now, the caveat to that is we'll probably have to put down six to 12 months of operating reserves yeah. in on hold with them, which could be substantial. But still, with everything else you get and the terms, it's still worth it. Any other uh, refinance closing costs in there? Yeah, it's, I think you're about 1% plus uh. like... 12 grand probably. I mean, you're going to be probably about 50 grand on this, I would think, for right 1% plus change. That's right. Flip I mean, because all the, the yeah, non-recourse, right. yeah, we've been 1%. I mean, it's been like 1 to 1. 1.5 after everything. Yeah, like it's, that. 50, yeah. yeah. It's, if the loan it's is 4 cheap. million, it's, yeah, another 10 to 15,000. And those, I believe, you have to pay out of the pocket, right? That's right, yeah. yeah. you can't wrap it in there. We can go interest only for a year or two. Okay. No PMI. So what's that? So you can see here, say interest only, it changes a couple amortized things. So we'll just say interest only. No PMI cap rate. We're, I mean, five and a quarter. I think is conservative. I think it actually be for the Highlands. You can get yeah. You can probably go. I'm just trying to yeah be conservative. But yeah, you a pretty aggressive would be four and three quarters probably. Yeah, high fours. But we'll we'll just say five and a quarter. Yeah. Keep it on there. All right, guys. Did we miss anything on these inputs here? Looks good. I think we nailed it. Yeah. All right. I have a hard time talking and typing, so we'll see. You're doing a good job, Chris. Um, total gross monthly rent. We so, have that number here. Yeah, so we're going to pull up the spreadsheet again. So this is the, I think this is the pro forma monthly rent, right? Yeah, and this was, yeah. we did this a, we did this rent study a year ago. So we were going over this and it's actually higher now, but let's just use this for, to be conservative. So we have total, we'll say 356, 820. Yeah, 356, 820. Now there's a field in here for other income for like parking and utility bill back. Just for simplicity, we're not we're gonna lump it all into one yeah. one rental thing. But we were just talking about laundry income actually yeah. yesterday with our property manager. We think we can get three to four hundred in laundry income at, at that building. Yeah, wow, on the, that size unit. Yeah, well, ten sh- units normally you're getting two to two fifty. Well, let's bump up to three sixty then. Let's bump it up. 
I'm in a good mood today. Let's do it. <laughs> All right. So other monthly income leave at zero. Uh, fixed landlord expenses. So this is where you plug in your operating data that you're paying as a landlord on here. That's right. So I will. Uh, I think we can probably put this image in the blog post on here. We'll make sure we can do it with bigger pockets. Yeah. But if one of you guys want to read this stuff off to me, I will. Uh, Lauren, why don't you read it off? Yeah. Perfect. Where I are we going to be it? starting at? You have the loveliest voice on the podcast today. Oh, thank you. <laughs> you should. Hey, Lauren, you've never seen a spreadsheet before. Read the numbers off to us. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. They're tired. Everyone's tired of hearing my voice. <laughs> I'm tired of hearing my voice. All right. So on the utilities, let's see. Where am I looking, buddies? So on the right, you should have uh, 2400 So utilities, pro forma, operating expenses. Perfect. Are we going pro forma or are we going pro forma expenses, right? Yeah, pro forma expenses. Okay. Yeah. So. All right. Utilities, we're at 2400 And let me just make sure. These are monthly, yes, I think. I want to make sure. Yep. Should be monthly. So 2400 Yep. On the maintenance repairs, we're at 13800 Maintenance repairs. We're at what percent? Do you know what percent you're using that to underwrite, Terrence? I just do. We on a fully renovated building, we're doing 50 per unit per month. That's how All we right. look at it. So they want a percent. Yeah. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take, remember, we're going to 13, 13,800. Divide by, we'll say 360 in rent. And that's 13,800 for the year, right? That's mm -hmm. right. So 3.8%. Yeah, 3.8% in repairs and maintenance. Um, do you separate out your capital expenditures? I think you do in a placement yeah, repairs, two, right? It's norm, it should be 250 per unit per year. So 250 times 22 units? 23. 23 units. So 5750. That's right. Uh, divide that by 360. Gives us, we'll call that 1.6%. So I actually want to stop talking about this for a second. So between these two, you're basically at 4.5, you're at 5.5% for repairs and CapEx expenditures, which if you're doing traditional underwriting, that's normally a little bit low. But since it's fully rehabbed, I mean, that's a legit number. Yeah, permitted every single square inch of that building's brand new. So it should be pretty low. I mean, the brand new roof, brand new windows, brand new boiler, okay, plumbing, electrical. I mean, they're, if something goes wrong in the first year, it's covered by warranty from the vendor. So... And what are we running vacancy at? We had it here at 3%, but I think, you know, right now, I th they're probably going to run it at 5 Yeah. And management fees? 7 Oops. 7%. All right, going back up here for any, any uh, so they, water we, and sewer? Yeah, we grouped all of that. Into grounds, maybe? Oh, that'd be utilities common space, okay. right? Yeah. Perfect. So that's what we bid yeah. 2400 Water, sewer, trash on that's going to be like 300 a month, I think, for that whole building, which we will build that back. But yeah, I think. Okay. PMI zero. Trash on that's going to be 400 a month. And that's not in this $2,400 electric bill, no, right? No. Okay. No HOA. No HOA. We have insurance on there. We got a real quote. It's 12 Six three nine twelve thousand six hundred thirty nine. Someone's okay. called ten thousand fifty a month. Sounds good. Is that good enough? That's good enough. Any other expenses we're getting on here? We got utilities, maintenance, repairs. Oh, we got to do grounds, right? Yep. So what? One fifty a month. You could do that. This was back when we thought we were going to have irrigation, but we did. We zero scaped it. Yeah. If you can remember, so it should just be snow. There is literally nothing to do for the grounds. It'll just be snow in the winter. And there's a parking lot out back, right? There's a parking lot. So we'll have to So that's going to bump up the... So you're probably, if you do 10... I th we were just talking actually with one of your agents, and he was saying they average 10 snow removals a year at 150 bucks. So 1500 Even the parking lot will do for that cheap? It should be 150 bucks, yeah. Okay. I mean, because you think if it's just the sidewalk, you'd be at like uh, 40 bucks, 50 bucks. So let's see, 1500 divided by 12... Is that one twenty-five a month? That's for snow removal. Yeah, and then utilities, repairs, maintenance, capex, grounds, PM, taxes, insurance. I think we got everything right. Looks good. Vacancy. 
And for your income growth, I think you'd run on that. I think post COVID, we're talking about two percent in Denver. I don't know. What do you think? What do you What are you guys underwriting at? I mean, you're talking like we just used to for do next three. Year? We used to do three, but I think you got to be conservative. Maybe one and a half to be safe. Yeah. I mean, I, I still underwrite things at three percent right now. I just don't know, but yeah. we can be conservative. I two. mean, two. Want to say two? Yeah, two. Um, annual PV growth. This is the property value. I mean, now now this Burr calculator is a lot meant for like single family, single family property, yeah. you know, property. So this is one of the the differences here. Multifamilies, mm-hmm. since this is a commercial property, it's more tr- it's bad. directly tied to the yeah. rent growth. So it'd be two, right? Yeah, I mean, it'll be not exact, but close enough. Right. Annual expenses. I mean, three percent or two yeah. percent. I like three. Yeah. Let's be conservative. So if you do turn around and sell it, what I mean, what as a you know, you shouldn't have too many like you know five percent probably five percent depends on. The, yeah, on this, the listing this size, you're probably talking about 2% listing to the brokers, and then you got other closing costs. So maybe you're closer to four Yeah. when you factor everything else in. Four is still a huge number. Yeah. That, All right, five so million range. we got there. Now let's calculate the results. Ooh. Do, 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 do. All right, so now we got the results page on here, and... Looking oh, through this. Oh, we did monthly. You got to re- go back to the monthly. So we did the income. We did annual, but it, they're looking at monthly there. Oh, uh, is that what happened? Mm-hmm. Yeah, look at mm-hmm. that. That I mean, that looks, the <laughs> NOI is I mean, massive. I love that. Dude, you got a 122% cap rate? Uh, yeah. What's wrong with that? It's insane. <laughs> should just right. retire. <laughs> in my last deal. I, um, all right, let's go back and fix this. So that's a good thing to realize is that everything that they're asking for, you have to do put in mm-hmm. monthly on the expenses and the income. Yeah. So, oh yeah, well you know if yeah. we actually read it, yeah, that'd be, run, that'd be helpful, huh? So thirty thousand a month. All right, no triple digit cap rates. Boom. Shouldn't have bought this property, man. Dude, terrible. Gosh, buying. what is it? Um, so pro forma four point four percent cap rate. So looking through the numbers here, I mean, there's a lot of stuff going on. So we're going to go back to the rehab period on here. So shows your holding costs at $276,000. Now, this is a, one of the other quirks you notice the calculator here. Since you actually have income coming in, it's hard to, like, put that in a calculator. Mm-hmm. And, you know, that's something a, a much more advanced spreadsheet can do. But for right now, like, this will be really close. Uh, and then doing the initial rental period, this is, like, the really important part here in the refinance. So you're at thirty thousand dollars a month in rental income. You're at twenty one thousand monthly expenses. That sounds way too high. That must include. Oh, that's the including the mortgage. Yeah, that's what it is. That's including yeah. the mortgage. So what we're gonna here just double check vacancy at fifteen hundred. About right. Capex four eighty. Water sewer three hundred. Insurance. There. Oh yeah, includes principal and interest on there. So they didn't do the interest only. Oh. Which is fine. Uh yeah, and then on the refinance they should do that. Yeah. So here's the refinance on here. We are at, again, $30,000 monthly, $23,000 monthly expenses. That just seems, I guess, again, that's that has a mortgage data. Yeah. I keep looking at that thinking that's incorrect. But here's a very high level here. So in Denver, what we see, so this thing at $230,000 annual NOI. So that's net operating income. So you got your gross rents. Right. <clears throat> excuse me, minus all your operating expenses, minus your non-mortgage uh, cost on there. So let's do 230 divided by 360. Puts us at uh, 64%. And a lot of times when our properties right around like the 33% rule. So this is spot on. And I think these numbers are actually, I think they'll probably be lower for some of the stuff. Wow. Well, the expenses should, I mean, maintenance and, you know, maintenance should be really, really low for yeah. the first couple of years. And then it'll uptick from there as there's wear and tear. Wow. Well. All right, and I'm curious on here, why is electricity $24 a month? Because aren't these individual meters? Oh, no, meters? you're right. That should be uh, the electricity. That was for the year. That, that was, was for, for the, the common year? areas for the for the owner for the okay. year. Okay. Yeah, so we we need to adjust that. Yeah. So and it should be 120 for the common areas. No, 200, right? 24 divided by 12. 200 a month. Good math, dude. Yeah. Dude, I was just trying to see if you were awake. Yeah, well, <laughs> you were well good test. sleepy over there. So one of the things I forgot to mention is rather than preparing all the stuff before, we decided to do it real time because this is what happens. And we thought it's better to actually do it real time so you can see we actually screw up and then we go back and double check things. 200 a month for the common areas. You're about nine bucks a unit is how we 
we it's between eight and ten dollars. We took the median of that. Okay. Eight and ten bucks per unit for the common areas per month. All right, now let's see where we're at. All right, round three. Round three. Third time's a charm. The cap rate went up. Purchase cap rate went up. Nice. Yeah, this is looking okay. Now we got the initial rental period. So, yeah, this is looking now. Now you're right at that one third mm -hmm. rule. So that that's looking right. Um, so I'm glancing at stuff. I don't see anything that jumps out. All right, so let's look at the refinance period. So this is once you refinance that long-term financing right around that two-year mark. So um, we're showing right around a 4.9 for five cent pro forma cap rate. We're showing inf infinite cash on cash return. I think it's because you had such a high loan balance. Mm. So that gets a little wonky there with the way we underwrote it on the, uh, the properties. Um, but overall, I mean, it's showing a... 1.95 DCR. It's great. I mean, which is for commercial, that's phenomenal. Phenomenal, yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Wait, wait, wait. It doesn't the meet the 1% rule. rule. Oh, they actually have 2% rule. 2% rule. That's what they're looking for. You can only like buy in like rural Iowa. Yeah. For two, if you want 2%. So you're not going to get that in Denver. Yeah. Especially, I mean, any property is not going to get 2%. Or but if you're seeing a multifamily around a 0.8%, you know, that's basically the inverse of GRM. And you're at a at a DCR above 1.5. That's phenomenal. It's good. So nice. yeah. So here's the analysis over time. Again, we put really conservative numbers in here. So I'm curious to see what this says because we put expenses at three percent increase while income's increasing at two percent. So normally underwrite it at you know three and three. Yeah, those or, cancel each other yeah. out. Yeah. So this is actually the NOI would be going down, right? Yeah, it's actually going to be going down on here. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. So year three is we're gonna start seeing the real data because that's everything stabilized, we're refinanced. So we're looking at year three here from your purchase. So this would be in 2021 uh, when you start seeing these numbers. So, so your annual expenses are around $105,000, zero mortgage payment because it's interest only. So your annual cash flow is $261,000. Um, and then your property value, is right around 5.5 million is the way they calculate based on the 5.25. I wonder why capital. there's no mortgage payment. There's still a mortgage payment. You're just not paying principal. Well, there's I think still... I think they're saying no uh, no, principal, no, principal. no principal reduction. Yeah. Okay. That's that's my guess on okay, there. Okay, cool. I hope so. Um, yeah. Yeah, we can go back and change and play around with it. So overall, if you were to sell the property, it says you'd be making about a $1.12 million profit. Does that sound about right? Yeah, total, oh, yeah, 1.137 is what we had. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, here, here's the thing. So, right here on the spreadsheet, um, total net uh, limited partner project profit, 1.137. We're at 1.12. That is good enough, close enough math. Pretty spot on, yeah. yeah. So, nice job, bigger pockets yeah. calculator. Yeah, so if you guys want to use calculators, like these are great calculators, especially if you're just starting out as a new investor. Yeah. Obviously, when Terrence are doing deals, they have an advanced spreadsheet they use for internal use. But when you're starting out, these calculators are perfect to use. Um, so I'm embarrassed to say this. Bigger Pockets gave us a coupon code. I don't know what it is. So check the show notes and you can use that to grab the calculators for free. Oh, they just sent it email? to us. I know. Hold on. I saved it and I forgot to print it off. Hold on. So we were too busy getting calculators. Chit done chat up here. for a second. All right. And let me get this. So I'd be really curious to hear the listeners' feedback on here as to, you know, we talked about this a few days ago as we were prepping this. Should we go ahead and, and have everything ready for you and present it? Or do we actually go through and plug the numbers in there? So we have we thought plugging the numbers in there would be more interesting because there's been a few uh, videos and podcasts recorded in the future where we're like, oh, let's go do it live. And it basically is blown up on us because like, oh yeah, our numbers don't add up, which is just part of the stinking reality. So we thought, hey, let's do the same thing. We're gonna give this one take, see how it goes. And we thought actually the chit chat back and forth, us looking at things would be more valuable than showing us, hey, great, we did three rounds before. Now here's a finished product. Chris, this just in. <laughs> Breaking news? Breaking news from Bigger Pockets. So we can offer 20% off of the pro membership, which comes with these rental calculators. And the discount code is ride along BP, all lowercase. Ride along right. BP. We can also, our listeners will receive 10% off of any 
book purchases, and it's Ride Along 10 All for right. books. Ride Along 10 for books. Ride along BP for the pro membership, which gets you access to all the rental calculators, enhanced networking features, which I know you and I, we met on Bigger Pockets, so there's a ton of value there. So I love that. We can offer 20% on the pro membership and 10 on the books. I have to say, I'm embarrassed I forgot those coupon codes because they're really simple. So thank you. But the <laughs> the nice thing is, is that we just got the email on the books. Yeah. So it was a good thing to pull it up anyway. Yeah. Awesome. It's great. All right. So, Terrence, Lauren, anything we need to add here before we uh, wrap this one up? Lauren, what did you think? I know this is, you've done a lot with investors on single family house hacks, duplex, mm-hmm. and smaller properties. What did you think about going through this? Anything stand out? Um, it's intimidating for sure, but uh, you guys definitely make it easy by unpacking some of those, those terms that I wasn't familiar with. Um, but as of now, I think we kind of tweaked everything on those operating expenses that obviously stood out to us. So, so far, everything is looking really, really good. What's an example or two? Because I'm sure that the audience maybe had the same same initial reaction on some of the terms. What are some of the terms that before we did the ride along and the financial breakdown, you maybe had heard but didn't totally understand that we helped to clarify? was the one that Chris decided to kind of ex- explain on. I think it was the uh, the lending one. The Oh, the, the agency the, debt? The agency oh, debt. Oh, agency yeah. debt. Oh, nice. Yeah. Because yeah. most of your experience, you've done a lot of like, a, like you know, four units and less investment, right? Exactly. Yeah. Not on this type of like loans. This is yeah. more of the commercial loan. So and you can't I, get non-recourse for residential loans. That's right. At least as far as I know, I don't think you can. Definitely not. Yeah. So, I mean, this is different type of... Financing, I kind of explain it as like the wild, wild west. There's really no rhyme or reason behind it. Uh, you just really need to make sure you partner up with with a really good bank or you know yeah. someone that can yeah. make sure that you're shown the uh, ropes on it for sure. Yeah, it's good stuff. Well, awesome. Well, thanks for being here. It was great to have you as a guest, and Appreciate. look forward to uh, continuing the conversation. Yeah, thanks, guys. Remember, make sure you thumbs up the video, subscribe, all that good stuff, so you can keep in more videos. And please leave us comments and questions because one of our goals of the show is to do a deep dive in the financials. Let us know how you like it and how we can do better.